OK. Um, what's next? Oh, yeah. So one reason why the, the subject is so difficult is because the primes are not distributed according to any regular pattern. Um, unlike other number sequences, like the square numbers, for example, are very regular. Um, I can tell you what the, the 1,000th square number is, is 1,000 squared. Um, but to tell you what the 1,000th prime number is, I have to actually just count them. Um, it's, it's, uh, and, and, and the primes, they, they, um, they seem to be very randomly spaced. Sometimes, for example, sometimes when you look at the gap between two primes, sometimes there's a very wide gap, sometimes there's a very small gap. It seems to fluctuate quite randomly. Um, and because of this randomness, we actually believe that the prime, the prime should fluctuate uh, sometimes with very big gaps, but sometimes with very small gaps. In particular, um, well, you, you can't have two primes that are adjacent, uh, except for two and three, because otherwise one of the, primes, one of the numbers is, is even, and not too many even primes in the world. Um, but uh, you should be able to have primes that differ by exactly two. And so there's an old conjecture, which may, in fact, go back to Euclid. Uh, it does not explicitly appear in his writings, but um, you can almost tell he was thinking about it. Um, for example, in his, the proof of, of, of Euclid's um, um, uh, theorem, he takes all the prime numbers and adds one. You could also take all the numbers, all the primes in the world and subtract one, and that would also give you another proof of Euclid's theorem, and those two numbers differ by two. Um, and so it's it, led by that, you can, you can sort of believe the following conjecture. It's called the twin prime conjecture. Uh, so maybe due to Euclid, it first explicitly appears in literature in maybe the 18th century, um, that there should be infinitely many, many pairs, p, p plus two, of primes which differ by exactly two. So there should be infinitely many twin primes, these are called. Um, and here are the first few twin primes, three and five, five and seven, 11 and 13, pairs of primes that differ by exactly two. So there's a lot of them. Here are, here are the first like 100 or so, the first few primes, the first few twin primes. Um, and again, we have found some pretty big ones. Here is the biggest pair of twin primes that has been discovered last year by a computer search. Um, and, uh, but do they go on forever? You know, for all we know, this is the last twin prime in the entire world. Okay, maybe, whoops, sorry. Um, do they go on forever? We don't know. Okay, that's a conjecture. Okay, we've worked on this for 3,000 years. There's some part, 2,000 years, there's some partial results, which I'll get to. Um, okay, so, so the primes seem to behave ma randomly. Now, of course, they're not random, okay? There's only one set of primes in the world, okay? It's, it's, it's not like they were created by, by rolling dice or something, but they seem to behave randomly. And in fact, there's a famous quote to this effect by the great Hungarian mathematician, Paul Erdős. So uh, he was responding to this, this famous quote of Einstein. Uh, Einstein said that uh, God does not play dice of the universe. He was complaining about certain interpretations of quantum mechanics. And Paul Erdős said, sure, God may not play dice of the universe, but something strange is going on with the prime numbers. <laughs> so, it's, uh, OK. So we believe that the primes actually, in many ways, behave randomly. So they're not exactly random, but they are, they're what we call pseudo. Or we believe them to be what we call pseudo-random. They behave as if they were random. Um, and various things connected to the primes also should behave randomly. Um, and this is not just uh, a philosophy or a, some sort of academic uh, uh, theory. Um, it actually is important uh, for many practical applications. Uh, so I talked about could talk, could cryptography before. So there's a, uh, there's a specific type of cryptography in particular called public, public key cryptography, which we use uh, in any sort of public network, um, including ATM machines and the internet. Um, if you want to transmit data securely, uh, our algorithms use primes, and they use the fact, they use the belief, they rely on, we are, we are placing in some sense billions of dollars of bets on the belief that primes behave in some sense randomly. Um, and thus far, the bets have been justified. I mean, they now, so let me explain what uh, public key cryptography is. Okay, so I'll give you first uh, an analogy, a physical analogy. Um, so suppose you, uh, um, suppose you have some box uh, of very valuable objects, okay, which we call G. Um, now, in cryptography, for some reason, that, um, you always call people either Alice or Bob, uh, and it's, it's traditional, so I'm going to do that. So, okay, so suppose, suppose you're Alice, you want to send a box of something very valuable to um, a friend, Bob, who lives somewhere else. So let's say you're in Norway, and you want to send it uh, to a friend in, in, in America, okay? Um, and so your only option is to mail it, okay? So you have to, um, but, uh, okay, you're, you're worried that uh, you, either the U.S. mail or the, or the Norwegian uh, post or whatever uh, might, you know, someone might just open, op um, open the box and take out what, what, what is in the box, okay? So uh, you, you, want to protect the, you want to protect the box. You want to make sure it, it goes over to Bob without, be, without the contents being stolen. 
Um, now, okay, of course you can lock the box, okay? You can put some, some, some padlock on the box. Um, and that will, that will protect it from some, someone just walking by and taking stuff in the box. But it would also stop Bob from opening the box. Right? Bob gets the box, he has a locked box, uh, and he, has, he doesn't have the key. Um, but let's assume for this analogy that these, these, these locks are unbreakable, right? Okay, so, um, okay, so you have, the, you have this, this lock, you have, you have, but he has no key, so what can you do? You, know, you can also mail the key, but of course the, the post can also steal the key. Um, and so that, that doesn't work. So how, okay, if everything you send could be, uh, could be intercepted, how can you securely send something over to Bob? Okay, this, this is the challenge. Um, and so if you, at first glance, this may, even, this may sound like an impossible task, but in fact, there are many ways to actually solve this problem. Um, and I'll give you one, one example. It's, uh, one example is called the, uh, the free pass protocol. So uh, what Alice does is uh, she does lock the box, okay? She takes the box and she has a padlock, which we'll call A, and she'll lock the box G with the, box, with the padlock A, and this creates a, lock, a locked box, uh, G to the A. And she sends the locked box over to Bob. Okay, so now Bob gets, a, so okay, the, the post cannot intercept this box. Now Bob gets a locked box, okay? Now she, Bob does not have the key to A. Bob cannot unlock A. So what Bob does is that he takes his own lock and puts his lock on the box too. Okay, so he has another lock, which we call B, and he will put, so he puts a second lock on the box, uh, and now he has a, now there's a box with two locks on it, which we call G to the AB. And he sends the doubly locked box back to Alice. Okay, now again, the, the, the post cannot do anything about this box, now it's two locks on it. Okay, so now Alice has a box, it's got her lock on it, and it's got Bob's lock. Now, Alice can't do anything about Bob's lock, but she can unlock her own lock. Okay, so. She now takes her, her own lock off using her own key, which she has kept, and there's now only Bob's lock on it, and she sends it back. And now Bob gets the, lock, uh, the box with only his lock on it. He can unlock his box, and that takes it out. Okay, and so, um, okay, so this works. In fact, this protocol is, in fact, uh, even used uh, by uh, uh, the U.S. government, actually, when they wanted to, to deliver documents physically. Uh, they actually, uh, from one place to another, they're top-secret documents, they actually use uh, this protocol. Okay, sometimes, um, or so I'm told. Um, okay. So um, that's the, this is the protocol for uh, for physical objects. Um, there is you can do exactly the same thing for digital uh, objects, data, uh, in particular numbers. Okay, so you have some. Uh, Alice has now has some number that she wants to send to Bob, a credit card number, a Swiss bank account number, some number that you do not want to share, except to Bob. And you can do a very similar scheme, and it uses prime numbers. Um, so um, the, the first thing you do is that Alice and Bob, they, have to, they, they talk publicly, um, say, by the mail, okay? and, and they, they, they agree on some very large prime number. Okay? Maybe you pick one of the prime numbers I discussed earlier. Um, okay. And so the, uh, the eavesdropper can, um, you know, uh, um, can, can, also can figure out this prime number, but it, it won't help them. Okay, so you pick this pin on P. Now, you're, okay, Alice has this secret number G that she wants to uh, send to Bob. So she first locks it, so she picks a number A that only she knows, a secret number A, and she locks G by raising G to the power A, um, and then, um, and, but, not taking, but not taking all of G A, just take the remainder of G A mod P. This, this sort of mixes up the number and only sends sort of part of G, G of A. So you take G of A modulo P, the remainder mod P, and this, this gives you some new number, and she sends it to Bob. So you see, Anyone who reads, takes, reads this number can't figure out G. I mean, they know G and they know P, but they don't know A. Sorry, they, they know P, but they don't, they don't know A. And so if you know G to the A, you can't figure out G, because um, A is just completely arbitrary. So, um, so this number is locked, okay, and Bob cannot decipher G from this G to the A, because he, Bob does not know A. So he takes his own secret number B, raises G to the A to the B, and creates a new number, G to the AB mod P and then sends that number back to Alice. And so that's another number that no one can decipher. And, but then what Alice does is that uh, she unlocks the, the A part by taking the eighth root. And th there's a way to take eighth roots modulo P. That's a, a, some number theory which I won't talk about. But you can unlock G to the A B mod P. That just gives you G to the B mod P. She sends that number back to Bob. Bob takes the B root and gets back G. This is called the Massey Omura crypto system and is actually used in, um, in many uh, practical applications. Okay. Um, 